Okay, folks. So uh, let's start because we we, we have a, we have a lot of ground to cover in, uh, in hours. So everybody, uh, a warm welcome uh, at this very uh, special uh, version or episode of uh, our Purpose Colleges. Uh, and uh, to, tonight we're very happy and very honored to welcome uh, John Fullerton in our midst. Uh, and we are here with a, a, a very big uh, uh, crowd. Uh, I, I can't see the exact numbers, but we're, we're, we're with a lot of people. Um, and, um, and, and, and the reason why we're with so many people is that this is a, a co-production or a co-creation um, of a collection of universities of applied science. Uh, so I wish you uh, welcome uh, 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 with thanks of uh, Saxion, NL Stende, Windesheim, uh, Avance, de Haagse Hogeschool Zuid, Hanse Hogeschool Zeeland en Hogeschool uh, Rotterdam. Sorry John, that was Dutch, but uh, otherwise uh, uh, translation would, <laughs> would, would be, uh, take me too much time. Um, so uh, the plan for tonight is uh, we have a, a roadmap that covers two um, uh, episodes, one could say. So first of all, we will start with, uh, with John who will uh, share his story uh, with, with us that will be approximately take us to the first hour. And then the second hour, we will have all the room to, um, to uh, ask John uh, uh, questions or make remarks and start, start uh, dialogues and discussion uh, in between each other. And we have a special uh, role for uh, Martijn uh, Schiphorst, who is a, a Saxion student, and, and he will uh, start the Q&A by interviewing uh, John with a couple of uh, questions he uh, he prepared, uh, and uh, and later on Martijn will invite all of us to uh, to also ask questions and make remarks, and hopefully we'll have an uh, an animated uh, uh, evening with each other. Um, so uh, le let me uh, shortly recap again. So because we we were so many, it is impossible uh, to. Um, ask uh, questions live and, and direct. So please, if you have any comments or questions, put them in the chat. We uh, we are sitting here with the whole team and we will make sure that uh, uh, all the questions uh, that we are able to answer, uh, we will make sure that uh, John uh, will uh, will answer them this, uh, this evening. And I will be later um, uh, sitting here with uh, Brazil, my colleague, and we will uh, uh, work uh, our way through um, your questions and uh, and remarks. Um, so before I introduce John and give him uh, the floor to share his uh, his story uh, with him, we we first wanted to start with a little poll. And if uh, if everything uh, is going right, technically this will be the moment that you will see this little poll that we prepared. <laughs> Does it work, folks? <laughs> yes, there it is. So. We are very interested to, uh, to, to, to see who you are. So what is the mix of, um, of people that are uh, in this webinar tonight? So are you a student or a teacher, lecturer, or maybe an entrepreneur or a policymaker, or maybe none of the above? Um, so please uh, submit your... Uh, personality with us so we can uh, we can also play around with that a bit also for John ah wow so the students are in the majority today, tonight. It is a good sign, folks. <laughs> We're in good hands. Yeah, that 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 makes me happy, John. <laughs> I hope you as well. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, many lecturers as well. So, um, so folks, um, I'm really really honored to 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 introduce John uh, John to you, John Fullerton, uh, a regenerative economist. Uh, founder of Capital uh, Institute, and in my humble opinion, and I'm not, and I know I'm not the only one, one of the great thinkers of new economics and uh, and the future of finance. Uh, 
so uh, without any ado, I would like to uh, give the floor to you, to you John, and um, uh, we're going to listen to your story, and then after that, we, we, we will uh, interact with each other and uh, go in depth into questions and, uh, and remarks about your story. Great, great. Well, thank you so much, Keys, and thanks everyone for um, for spending some time this evening. I hope everyone brought their uh, their their dinner and a beer because um, we're we're going to have a two hours will be a long session. Um, but uh, we'll try to keep it. There we go. <laughs> uh, we'll we'll try to keep it as entertaining as as we can. And I think um, you know I'm really thrilled at the at the interest. I think the um, the topic of our the future of our economy is obviously very much front of mind uh, these days in part uh, coming out of the pandemic but in part just because it's starting to feel like everything's falling apart around us and we're all grasping myself included for fresh fresh ideas and and fresh ways to to get a hold of the of the challenge um, so but before I sort of launch into my story and and my ideas um, I too would like to uh, do a little poll. Uh, this is a question that I actually um, asked on an island off the coast of Stockholm. It's probably about 10 years ago now. Uh, we had a gathering of the Club of Rome to wrestle with the exact topic that we're talking about here. And, um, and I thought it'd be useful to, to gauge from members of the Club of Rome and for those of you not familiar with the Club of Rome, uh, the, the Club of Rome is famous mostly for the launch of a book called Limits to Growth in 1973, which was really the first time uh, complexity scientists had looked at the, um, the, the kind of logical rollout of the exponential growth economic model on a finite planet and what that might entail down the road. And, and of course, that, that model was very um, uh, kind of, you know, simplistic relative to modeling today, but turns out their, um, their scenario about the future turned out to be pretty much exactly spot on to what we're now experiencing. And so uh, hopefully there's new interest in the book. Um, I think it should be required reading or at least the research you know, that validates it afterward at every university. Um, but, um, uh, but anyway, so we asked this question at this gathering of 20 or 25 Club of Rome members 10 years ago. And, and so we're gonna ask you all this question, two questions as well. Uh, the first question is uh, on a scale of one to 10, uh, what is your estimation of the probability of systemic collapse in the developed economies over the next, you know, 10 or 20 years. <clears throat> and I think Brazil is, I can't Good see question. Is that, is that, is, is the system working in terms of answering? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's working. Okay, yep. Yep. Great. And, and, you know, define collapse for yourself, but, but I specifically said in the developed economies, because obviously in many underdeveloped economies, you could argue quite, quite convincingly that collapse is already underway or has been underway. Um, ready for the second question? So, and, and just to be clear, one meaning the probability is almost zero and 10 meaning it's a near certainty, okay? And the second question is, regardless of how you answered question number one, um, will the cause of collapse more likely be economic, financial, ecological, or political? Mm. I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but I can't see the answer, so someone will have to share with me. 52% ecological, 13% financial, 18%, 20% economical, and I can't see political, but let me check if that is. And 17%, 17% political. So mostly ecological. Yeah, mostly ecological, yeah, 44% now. Okay. 
And what was the skew on the first? Are we, are we with optimists or pessimists or four? The average was about four? Yeah, the average was about four. Oh, on a scale of six, uh, John. Oh, on a scale of six? Yeah. Oh. So we're not so, we're not so optimist. <laughs> so four meaning uh, more likely that we're going to collapse? Yeah. Four. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And how many were at six? Many? Ten percent, ten percent, um, uh, approximately ten percent uh, at six. And how about at one or two? She's going to double check now. She's give us a second. Two, two and six percent. Wow. So yeah. So we're a bit worried tonight. <laughs> that's a that's a polite way of putting it, uh, John. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're in we're in Holland after all, so we're we're more enlightened than uh, than than other places I tend to go. Um, but honestly, the reason I I asked that question um, both tonight, but also you know a, a decade ago, is that just the thought of having to ask that question is a definition of insanity, right? Um, I mean, we live on this planet and and with all of this um, you know magnificent um, uh, abundance we are literally you know it doesn't matter what your probability is if the probability is more than two percent it's insanity um, and I would I would just draw as an analogy and and you know as, 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 as you all know I come out of the financial world and the financial markets and when the financial collapse happened in 2008, the risk models predicted with 99% confidence that that wouldn't happen. So in other words, we that was a different complex system, uh, the financial markets, and and the models we use were, were estimating that the risk of collapse was less than 1%, and look what happened. And I would argue the interconnected ecological, political, socioeconomic financial system is far more complex than the financial markets. And, um, you know, just in our little poll, uh, you know, we're just to be polite, we're, we're, we're assessing the risk of collapse at 50%. Yeah. And um, so, and yet the world is not on fire about that. Whereas, you know, the, 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 um, the reaction to the risk in the financial markets was much more palpable even leading up to it uh, than, than it feels today. So it feels like we're still asleep, even though um, at least thoughtful people are, are very awake about literally the, the, the dangerous path that we're on. And it's sort of this slow motion car wreck. Um, and I guess I start with all that, not to kind of ruin your evening and Although you do have some beers, I don't have a beer, so you'll be in better shape than me. But, but really, just to um, begin my own um, story about the the kind of journey into this question about the future of our society and the future of of our economic system, which I believe is at the heart of and and the root cause of certainly the ecological crisis, and I would argue the social and political. Um, and obviously financial, uh, the, br the brittle financial markets as well. So for me personally, having spent nearly 20 years in the belly of the beast, um, I always like to say at the old JP Morgan, because the, the firm I worked for was a very different animal than JP Morgan today. Um, just to sort of a refresher, since you, you all mostly are students and, and too young to remember this, but when I left JP Morgan in 2001, we had 30,000 employees. And I think JP Morgan today has something like 250,000 employees. I don't, I don't really know the number. Um, the balance sheet was 300 billion uh, when I left in 2001. And, and 2001 to me doesn't seem like that long ago, even though that, that probably does seem like a long time ago if, if you're a student. Uh, today, the balance sheet is over 2 trillion. So. I left at a time when I sensed, in, I intuited something was going terribly wrong, and the the world I left is is sort of um, unrecognizable compared to the way the world exists today within the financial markets. And it's it's always 
uh, I think, eye-opening to realize that just because things are the way they are right now doesn't mean they're not going to get radically more dangerous in the future. We, we have a, such an, a, a sort of a mindset that's focused on the very near present, and maybe we look forward a year or two and we look back five years. But in the time that I've been on the journey wrestling with this question, the world has become 10x more insane um, as I've been wrestling with the question. Um, I guess the, the, the reason that I left Morgan um, is, is really, I don't have a good answer. There was no event that caused it other than the merger with Chase and it made it easy to leave. Um, but it was really an intuitive uh, sense that I knew that I wasn't fulfilling my purpose and I wasn't that happy. And despite having ridden the derivatives wave and being a young, you know, successful managing director, I just knew that the, the reason I went to work in the banking world was no longer the reason I was there. And it was all about, you know, success and power and money and, and titles. And I just, I just wasn't, I just wasn't happy, I guess. And so I used the opportunity of the merger to leave with no plans and, um, and just figure out I, I would, I would find my way into what I was going to do next. And, and in fact, I was dabbling with what we now call impact investing. I was in, investing in, uh, uh, charter schools, for example, with Morgan's money back in the 90s. So I was already wrestling with this idea of aligning social and environmental purpose to the capitalist system. Um, but um, but I left in 2001, and literally the first day I went back into uh, Manhattan. In fact, I had a meeting downtown with a guy who ran a different charter school company, and I was thinking about maybe getting involved in in that uh, industry and. Um, the meeting happened to be at 9.30 in the morning on September 11th. So uh, literally the first time I was back in New York City since I had left, I don't know, maybe April, uh, I arrived, uh, I was in the subway at, at, at uh, 9.50 when the Trade Center, when the planes hit the Trade Center. And so I came to the street um, in the subway stop down at City Hall, which is, you know, two stops from uh from where the trade center is and um and and got to the street literally moments after the second plane hit so there was something about experiencing that um up close and in person far enough away to be safe but close enough to experience it in a very visceral way and my kids at the time were you know young you know sort of five seven nine ish um and took me all day to get home and i think that experience um kind of convinced me that something much more fundamentally was going on, fundamentally wrong was at, at work here and no one understood it. And, and the reaction was, let's get at, let's get the bad guys. But my reaction was to kind of push me into a deeper um, que questioning period. And I spent years of my life after that reading books like I'd never done before. And in that period, in that process, um, I read Limits to Growth, for example, and and uh, and I discovered the environmental crisis um, and and that it wasn't about the owl and the whale. It was a systemic issue. And um, and and the realization dawned on me that that our entire economic system and the way we operate the financial system was the root cause of all of these problems. And so I'm sort of looking in the mirror thinking, boy, you're this young whippersnapper thinks you're so smart derivatives hot shot. And um, and you're completely ignorant of, of what's really happening. And of course, I knew that all of my colleagues were as well, because we never talked about this stuff. Um, we talked about uh, deals and making money and transactions and the esoteric nature of finance. Um, but we were living completely ignorant. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I mean, literally ignorant, like not aware of. Uh, the the impact the the economy and the growth and the material throughput of the economy was having uh, around us. So we were we were not bad and evil. Uh, we had lots of ethical challenges in the industry, which came home to roost in big time. You know, eight ten years later. Um, but even back then, it was you know there were there were ethical issues. But um, anyway, that's the the sort of launch into my my. Um, my journey of, of questioning, and I'm still on that journey questioning. And, and I'd say since, you know, 
there are so many students here tonight. There's no question in my mind, if, if, if you can take one thing away from me uh, tonight, is that the, the entire field of economics and finance is in the very beginning of a complete reimagination. Um, and the, the work both in the academy and in the practical world uh, and in the world of policy is, is right at the beginning of a, of a multi-year, probably multi-decade um, rethinking. And so as, as terrifying as it may be, it's also a, a tremendous opportunity to be uh, thinking out of the box and, and with fresh ideas. So with that, let me um, launch into some slides. Um, it'll keep me on task so we don't spend three hours <laughs> instead of two. Um, hopefully this will work. Yep, I think we... Let me see. You see the... Uh... Not yet. Huh. Uh, I can see that. Let me see. Let me try again. Yeah, well, yeah, there it is. There yes? it is. Yep. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, is it still there? No, now it's gone. <laughs> Sorry, it, it was there. Bill Gates is having his fun with me. Yeah, I think so, eh? But they were definitely there. So, yeah, there it is again. It is? Okay. Yep. All right, I guess I just, so can you still see me? Yep. Okay, good. Well, I can't see me, but that's okay. <laughs> I know what I look like. <laughs> um, okay, so so the, the big idea today is that we um, we need to move into a regenerative way of thinking, uh, a holistic way of thinking and seeing the world. And this process of regeneration is what's caught my imagination and I'll hopefully share that uh, infection with you all. Um, of course, now my slides aren't moving. There we go. Yep. Um, and and uh, the, the, the first thing I'd just like to say is that most people that are wrestling with this sustainability challenge and crisis, um, I believe are trapped in a worldview that they're not even conscious of because it's, it's, a, it's the modern age uh, worldview that we've all been taught and trained in and any of our teachers have been taught and trained in. In fact, probably it's, it's locked into our DNA that we, when we find a complicated problem, we look to break it down into um, simple parts and um, and address the parts and often lose sight of the whole. And this reductionist method is very um, useful and has been responsible for much of our great progress, but um, it has this Achilles heel, which is that we lose sight of the, the greater picture that we, we lose the, the forest in the trees. And, and I think that simple statement that this guy Einstein had figured out um, uh, is really at the heart of our of our challenge today. So, you know, remembering going back uh, in history a bit, we we used to believe that the um, the sun rotated around the Earth and the Earth was the center of the universe. That was a worldview that um, was maintained for over a thousand years, and it defined, um, you know, how we how we saw problems, how we saw our purpose uh, in this world. And um, without belaboring that point, I would argue today. In a similar, almost religious sense, the um, uh, the free market system, the law of supply and demand, the invisible hand of Adam Smith, um, pretty much defines our worldview. Our worldview is dominated by economics uh, more than we realize. We constantly assess decisions in a cost-benefit analysis that's grounded in in economics. And as this joke implies, we, we literally think of the invisible hand as this, you know, superhuman natural law that, you know, you could see uh, in the distance. And, and Darien, Connecticut, by the way, is a town not far from where I lived for 30 years, where a lot of the Wall Street folks commute to. So uh, this was a New Yorker cartoon a while back. But more seriously, um, two years ago, 
uh, a little over two years ago, William Nordhaus of Yale University won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his um, uh, model. He, he's an environmental economist um, and probably the most um, well-known environmental economist in the world. And he won the Nobel Prize for the work on his model that calculated the optimal target for global warming. And the model per suggested that three and a half degrees Celsius was the optimal target. And most of you, I'm sure, by now know that, that the scientific consensus from climate scientists is that anything over one and a half degrees puts us at, you know, puts us in peril. Um, and life as we know it on this planet is at risk. And somehow, um, not only could the field of ecological, or rather environmental economics, come up with a different answer, but the Nobel Prize Committee would award the highest prize in economics, which isn't a true Nobel Prize, but that's a story for another day. It's, a, it's actually the Swedish Central Bank Prize um, as, a, as part of an attempt to, to give the field of economics the same stature as, as science and the arts. Um, but, but, but even more startling is that when that award was given, there was a little note you know, noticed in the press, but mostly my friends would send me emails saying, oh, you must be happy. Your, your environmental stuff has just won the Nobel Prize. And, and the point is that um, uh, I, I believe Dr. Norhaus is so blinded by the ideological worldview that he holds, which is that growth is the source of prosperity. Therefore, growth, economic growth, the growth of material throughput in the planet is a necessity. And we're just going to trade off cost benefit analysis with how much damage that growth will allow us. And, you know, essentially the model said that if we grow faster, we'll be richer. So we'll be able to deal with the problems. Um, and it's, it's sheer insanity. Um, another sheer insanity is this. This is pretty much the way I looked at the world through the lens of a, of a sort of high financier, Wall Street uh, finance guy, which is that um, economic efficiency uh, is created when you uh, when you use finance, the allocation of capital, financial capital, to organize the economy in such a way that the natural resources of the planet and the human resources from the planet, meaning human beings, are organized in such a way to optimize the efficient return on capital. And and we didn't show it in a diagram like this, but that's literally what we believe in the Wall Street paradigm. Um, and, and we don't believe that because we're bit bad, evil people. We genuinely believe that if you, if you organize the economy in such a way that you, you generate the most efficient, uh, best risk return adjusted return on capital deployed, that will make the economy efficient, meaning it will grow faster relative to the inputs, the resources used. And since it'll grow faster, that will create more jobs and more prosperity. And um, never mind how that prosperity is allocated, it'll create the biggest pie possible, and we can leave it to the politicians to allocate it. That is, that is not just a belief, that is like assumed to be a, an, an unquestioned law of economics. And, you know, I would argue that this picture is literally entirely inverted from what a more holistic understanding of finance which needs to be in service of the economy, which needs to be embedded in society, which of course is embedded in the biosphere, the planet that we live in. So we're gonna need to rethink economic finance literally at that basic foundational level um, because it's, it's literally inside out, upside down. Here's really the way the real world actually is organized. Um, you know, in, in, and, and, and here I'm, I'm stretching my understanding of physics, but in the original classical physics, uh, Newton figured out that the apple falls from the tree because of gravity, the law of gravity. And there are laws in physics that operate primarily at, a, at, a, at the micro level. Um, there are very few things that actually have a simple cause and effect. In fact, you could argue that an apple falling out of a tree is not simply the, the law of gravity, but it has to do with uh, you know, the, the strength in the stem and and the time of the season and how, how windy it is and, and whatnot. But, but we all understand generally there are many things that have relatively straightforward, simple cause, cause and effect, single cause, um, uh, or single causality, like, like the laws of, um, of classical physics. Um, 
Over on the right is the, this idea of disconnected causes, meaning random. And, um, and statistics do a marvelous job at predict, you know, probability theory, um, dealing with the uncertainty of disconnected causes, de dealing with the uncertainty of random events like rolling a dice. Um, unfortunately, the field of economics and finance um, recognize that the world is more complex than simple classical physics that the theory was originally built on. Um, but because the math was easy to use statistics, uh, much easier than using nonlinear um, uh, complexity science, we essentially, for most of the theories that are the, the bedrock of economics and finance, we, we essentially just built a statistical uncertainty on top of Newtonian physics, and, and in fact, are using models that don't at all describe the real world of, of intertwined causes um, and interconnectivity. And so we have things like the subprime crisis in the United States causing the entire financial system to collapse back in 2008 because of those uh, complex interconnection, even though the risk models said the probability of that happening was you know, less than 1%. So what I'm suggesting is that the entire intellectual framework of, of, uh, of modern economics, whether you're a socialist leaning economist or a hardcore American capitalist leaning economist, they're all built on this idea of, um, uh, of uh, that, that is essentially you know, flawed in terms of its um, uh, academic foundation. And, and that's a, you know, a bold thing to, to claim. And I, I, I'd be happy to discuss further than that in, in the Q&A. Um, it's, not, it's not welcome in, in the fields of, of economics and finance. And in fact, you know, when I speak at universities, I'm rarely, if ever, invited. There's only one finance professor that invites me um, because I, I mean, finance in particular is built on statistical models that are backward looking and, and just divorced from the reality of the real world. And, and the proof is that they don't work. Um, so there's, a, as I said at the beginning, there's a ton of, um, of, of new thinking and, and, and conceptual work that um, lies ahead. Um, now I'm having, am I still there? Yep. Okay, good. Yep. Um, I was having trouble moving the, moving the slides. Okay, no what, I, what I've gotten interested in is, is this idea of looking to the natural world for the patterns and principles that explain uh, how things really work and how things are really organized, and then applying that to the human economy with the idea that the human economy is a living system since humans are living systems. And we now understand from Gaia theory that, that increasingly the scientists are seeing the entire biosphere as a complex living system. So I simply argue, how is it possible that if the systems that sustain themselves have certain qualities and characters and behaviors and patterns and principles, how is it possible that the human economy could sustain itself if they don't follow those same patterns and principles? Um, this is a, an interesting um, uh, view of the planet uh, based on actual data from NASA. Um, uh, it shows you the, the seasonal uh, shifts which give this very visceral sense that our planet actually is a living system um, and um, and I think it's it's important to keep in mind when we when we um, are dealing in the in the nitty gritty of economics and finance and business and policy. Um, but the the you know the, the the first here the first big point of this journey for me is that the moment we're living in is really quite remarkable. Um, I think it's comparable to uh, the, the, the the most comparable period that, that exists that, that is similar would be the shift from the medieval era to the modern era. When we move from the, um, you know, the earth is at the center of the universe perception to, um, thanks to um, uh, Copernicus and Galileo, who essentially proved that that wasn't wrong when Galileo um, was able to prove that with, with his telescope. And of course, when you, when, you, when you go through a shift like this, that, you know, the last time it happened was almost 500 years ago, it's going to be very unsettling to everyone uh, around. And I think part of what we're feeling, part of what we're seeing in our politics is that is the unsettling fear of 
the earth literally shaking underneath our feet and our entire worldview coming into question that, you know, the evidence, you know, just like when, uh, when uh, rather um, Galileo was able to prove with his telescope that the sun actually is, is rotating around the earth and not the other way around. If we can prove that exponential growth on a finite planet will destroy ourselves, it essentially upsets the entire apple cart of what we assume to be true without questioning. And I think that's what's happening right now and why it's so unsettling. Uh, but the good news is that that reality is becoming, um, you know, from when I started 10 years ago, uh, and, and in a sense, everyone thought I was crazy, that reality now is, is almost uh, irrefutable. And it's, you know, the evidence uh, in the poll we took at the beginning of this class is, is proof to that, to that fact. But you guys are primarily students. The people running the world wouldn't have answered that question that way, I promise. They would have been, um, they would have either laughed that the question was being asked, uh, or they would have put the probabilities much, much lower. So, you know, the last time we, we, we put um, to question the entire worldview of at least the Western world, those in power were pretty resistant to this idea. And in the, in the Inquisition, where Galileo was um, uh, subjected to house arrest for the rest of his life, he was told to abandon completely the, even the mention of the idea that the, um, that the sun is at the center of the world. Because to the, to the Catholic Church, that was very threatening because their entire um, uh, um, you know, credibility as the arbiter of, of right and wrong and you do this and you go to heaven. If you do that, you go to hell. It was all predicated on the idea <clears throat> that the earth was at the center of the universe and the church was at the center of the earth with a direct connection to God. Now, uh, notice, by the way, the, uh, the, the red power cult color um, uh, carries on to those in power. I would um, somewhat jokingly refer to Alan Greenspan as the modern day pope uh, in the Church of Economics. As I said earlier, I do think economics has become, in a sense, our religion that we bow down to, even if we don't think of it that way. And after the financial crisis, even Alan Greenspan said that the entire economic or the, the entire intellectual edifice of the financial paradigm was um, had collapsed. And he was um, speechless and idealist as to what went wrong and and um, and, and what he missed. Um, he's one of the few people that have had that very humble uh, uh, acknowledgement. And of course, once you say that suddenly you're not as popular anymore with the powers that be. And so we don't hear from him as much as we used to, but it'd be fascinating to hear what he's thinking now. Now, of course, we have a new Pope, same red, a little less of it than before. And in 2015, um, he wrote the, the encyclical. And again, I'm not Catholic. This has nothing to do with religious. I'm just saying that even the institution of the church is able to evolve, and uh, the language in the encyclical is highly aligned with this whole holistic approach to a regenerative economy and a, and a regenerative society. Um, so it's very promising. At the, in the same year that the encyclical was released, um, I released my first attempt at describing this in this paper called Regenerative Capitalism, How Universal Principles and Patterns Will Shape Our New Economy. And I released it in at Yale University's joint um, uh, school of Business and the Environment, and I use the word capitalism in part because I was in America and I didn't. I, I wanted to be. I wanted to be kept in the conversation, but um, really, this is about regenerative economics. And as I said earlier, um, the differences between social democracies and hardcore capitalism, with respect to the issues I'm interested in, are are, are minor tweaks. Um, we could debate that, but. Um, uh, my point is that this this is not about capitalism versus socialism. And this holistic way of seeing is really transforming virtually every field of knowledge. My interest, obviously, is in economics and finance, but I guarantee you, you're seeing and hearing similar conversations happening in all these fields of knowledge. And if they haven't started, like, for example, in philanthropy, I believe they will um, in the near future. So a quick definition, uh, what I think of as regenerative economics is the application of nature's laws and patterns of systemic health, self-organization, 
self-renewal and regenerative vitality to socioeconomic systems. Um, there, there's been lots of evolution in economic thinking to deal with, in particular, the ecological crisis. Um, I do believe regenerative economics deals with both the equity and the ecological issues as, as we can talk about. But just to trace the history a little bit, you know, neoliberal economics really since the Reagan, Thatcher, uh, Milton Friedman era um, has been the dominant uh, economic paradigm. This is the idea of the invisible hand reincarnated from Adam Smith. Uh, free markets are better than government regulation, globalization, all that stuff that you're very familiar with. In fact, that we just assume was always true and has to be. Um, I believe is largely an ideological era, error that that resulted from a fear of communism. In in you know, to put it bluntly, um, then we realized there were these things called in externalities, and we needed to put prices on externalities to capture them back into the system. The whole field of environmental e economics is actually very good at attempting to do that, but uh, I would argue that it's a you know, there's, there are limits to, you know, what you can price into a system. And as my colleague Peter Brown once uh, beautifully said, there's a difference between a cost that you can fix with money and a wrong that can never be fixed. And, and the, you know, the, the, the stunning illogic of the Nobel Prize being awarded for a, an economic model that suggests we ought to target three and a half degrees is to me proof that the, there's sort of a self-defeating uh, logical error in this idea of, of externalities, um, which isn't to say that we don't need to deal with them. It's just to say that that's not going to be a solution. Herman Daly uh, developed the field of ecological economics probably three decades ago. Um, uh, this was massive breakthrough, the idea that scale matters. You know, the, the actual uh, definition of macroeconomics in, 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 in your textbooks is essentially the sum of all the microeconomies. Um, and so you add up all the households, families, individuals, uh, businesses, government sector, you add all those together and you get a number and that's the global economy and that's the macroeconomy. And again, if you just compare that to what we understand about living systems, we know that every living system is far greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, we know that we as human beings are, are not simply the sum of our organs and our skin and our arms and our legs. Uh, but somehow in, in economics, we've got this mechanist, mechanistic idea uh, which, which destroys the, the most uh, amazing magical part of any living system, which is the holistic uh, sum is greater than, than the, uh, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And so I think we need to make another final leap beyond ecological economics, even though that's done tremendous, uh, made tremendous progress, because if we're left with this idea that, that, that eco economic growth, the growth of material throughput on a finite planet will destroy us, um, it's, it sort of leaves us trapped because we know that we've built this entire machinery of the economy on the assumption of growth, everything from our pensions to uh, our municipal governments, to uh, our national governments, to the global um, peacekeeping apparatus, all of these things are funded by taxes that are predicated on uh, exponential growth. So if there's no new source of prosperity, we're kind of doomed. Um, and that's given rise to a lot of discussions about degrowth and, um, you know, s sort of a soft Making you know, getting ready for a soft landing and and massive decentralizing and essentially going back to a much more primitive style of economy. And I I suspect some of that will be necessary. Um, but the cool thing and the hopeful thing about the regenerative paradigm is that um, by aligning the human economy with how living systems work, the idea is that we can unlock similarly similar potential that living systems demonstrate, and that's the same potential that. You know, you go to university and are trying to identify what's the core essence of who you are and how you're going to manifest that in the world. And that's something that, you know, no one could predict in advance. It's it's almost this, um, you know, it's, it's this magical potential that um, that exists in living systems. And the hope of regenerative economics is that we can learn how to unlock that in our economies as well. 
And in case that seems far-fetched to you, I've been practicing investment in, in accordance with regenerative economics, and I've seen this in the real world. And I'll give you a couple examples uh, a little bit later on. But I'm certain it's real. I'm not certain how, how difficult it will be to systematize it and create it at, at a scale that will be meaningful for uh, the communities, all communities around, around the world. Um, it's just a question of how we, you know, how effectively we can make this transition. One way to think about this regenerative paradigm and, and, and understand the difference between it and sustainability is this um, spectrum that my colleague Bill Reed uh, generated for the built environment. He's a, he works with um, uh, real estate development projects primarily. And so this was essentially designed for you know, real estate development, but I simply changed a few words and applied it to the entire economy. And here you see on the left is kind of where we are today. Um, and we're trying to move toward the right by greening things. But we've got this mechanistic uh, reductionist mindset. And so we go about trying to solve our problems incrementally one at a time, when often our problems are really the result of our prior solutions creating new problems because we approach things in this reductionist mindset. And we can make real progress towards sustainability uh, by moving incrementally, you know, solving problems from the left to the right. But in order for us to truly become sustainable, we actually need to flip over to the right into this holistic paradigm, natural systems design, uh, looking for patterns rather than parts. And my argument is that if we can align the human economies in accordance with this regenerative process, the sustainability will be the outcome of that process. So, so regeneration is a process that creates the outcomes we desire. And we can define those outcomes as STGs. We can define them as staying within the, um, uh, the donut in Kate Raworth's beautiful pictorial um, uh, synthesis of planetary boundaries and ecological, or sorry, social floors all in one picture. But those are, those are the goals of the system. The, ch the challenge is how do we reach those goals? And, and, and my strong argument is that we can't reach those by simply moving from the left to the center. We need to make this flip into uh, this regenerative process and understand that and apply that to the economy. And then we'll find that we'll be able to achieve the SDGs, we'll be able to get ourselves inside the donut, et cetera. Um, I don't want to go through these in detail today because it, it kind of will drag on too much, but in the paper, I have tried to reduce this regenerative process to a set of principles um, uh, to guide us. So think of this as the compass to, to determine whether we're on track uh, toward being regenerative. Um, these are not rules. These are not laws. These are not, you know, the correct eight principles. These are one man's best effort to reduce to linear language, which is not, you know, in inherently non holistic, uh, but as a way to get our, our heads around it. So we're we're now dropping from holistic understanding into reductionist methods to try to communicate. Um, and, and others will have different ways of saying these same things. But if you do study living systems, you will find some, some relation to each of these uh, eight principles, I think, in, in understanding how living systems work. So, for example, living systems work in right relationship. The parts are in symbiotic win-win relationship. Interesting contrast with our competitive system of capitalism in direct opposition to the way living systems work. Uh, living systems seek balance. That's in direct opposition to economics, which is about optimizing efficiency. Um, turns out in living systems, uh, the, there is a window of vitality between efficiency and resiliency. And, and systems that sustain themselves over time find this sort of delicate balance. It's a constantly moving balance uh, between resiliency and efficiency. And in fact, it's skewed toward resiliency. So no shock that we've collapsed the financial system and are uh, at risk of collapsing the global economy and the biosphere with it, or at least the, the critical um, you know, functions that we need to live, because we've had this massive economy pursuing efficiency without any um, recognition of the importance of resiliency. A robust circulation, that, like think of a metabolism. 
How does the metabolism work? Well, it, there's a balance of large, medium, and small veins in our system to move blood and oxygen around our veins. And yet we allow uh, business organizations to become massive. We allow banks to become centralized and they cut off the flow of oxygen out to the regions um, uh, of the economy. The edge effect is this idea that, that diversity and life and, and innovation happens at the edges between different systems. So think of it as the edge between one sector of the economy and the other, or the edge between the private sector and the public sector. This is where innovation is likely to come in a truly regenerative system. Uh, the idea of community in place, um, uh, living systems by definition exist in place, and a human economy, uh, you know, human culture and the geological history of a place defines the, the reality of a place. So, so the reality in, in Holland is very different than the reality in New England, where I'm speaking to you from, and that's both cultural and, um, uh, and geological. And so how could it be possible to have a unit, you know, a, a monoculture global economy that didn't honor and respect the essence and the unique genius of each of these different places? Um, empowered participation is this idea that um, for a system to be healthy, all the parts of the system need to participate in the health of the system. So I just like to use the example in a human body of our feet or our toes. Um, if our toes are not empowered to participate in the circulation of oxygen, we eventually can't walk. And if I can't walk, I can't fulfill my potential as a human being. So it's not about my poor toes giving them some oxygen out of charity. It's that I can't be uh, my real, true, and, and full potential self if my toes aren't participating and contributing to the health of the whole. So it changes the way we think about inequality if we understand that. Um, Massive inequality actually is not just bad for those on the on the short end of the stick, but it's actually bad for the whole system. And I think we're seeing that being proved in the real world with what's happening, the political backlash that's um, that it's um, uh, fostering. Innovative, adoptive, and responsive. This is where capitalism shines. Um, I don't believe the answers will come from institution, you know, large bloated institutions of central command. I think the answers will come at the edges where innovation and and adaptation. Adaptation happens, and so we need to foster a very entrepreneurial economy if we're going to have a regenerative economy. And finally, this idea of wealth is not money. Um, uh, I think that's well understood now, but you know, we have an economic system that defines wealth as money. Uh, when we know there's all these other forms of wealth, other forms of capital, uh, first and foremost, the natural capital that our entire economy is dependent upon, um, to exist. And, and each of these has many, many layers below that. Um, I'm actually working right now on a book that will come out this summer that, that will go into much more detail in, in each of these. Um, so, for example, Seek's balance, you know, the balance in living systems of the masculine and feminine is self-evident. But we have a global economy that's primarily a, a, a masculine dominated. And I don't, I don't say male dominated, I say masculine dominated culture. And not surprisingly, it's turning out not to be healthy. So hopefully you get the idea. The final thing to say about all this though is that it's not like multiple choice, work on one or two of these. The idea of a regenerative process is that all of these have to be in, in operation. These describe regenerative living systems. And so what we need to do is find the weakest link and work on those to improve all of these collectively. Um, I've applied this same framework to investment. I won't get into that in much detail uh, here today, but if you are interested in the sustainable finance topic, you can see how I've laid out the different aspects of sustainable finance from uh, index funds and ESG to active um, engaged ESG. ESG stands for Environmental, Social and Governance. It's a, a way of uh, making more transparent um, uh, various factors in in, uh, in, in, in business, uh, impact investing, green bonds, but then all of the creativity and all of the real work left to be done is over on the right. And, um, and this is really still very much in the future. It's very, uh, very limited examples of it happening in the real world yet. So for the same reasons I said at the beginning, finance needs to be completely inverted inside out. I think the practice of finance is gonna be the hardest to change and it's probably the least far along this, this journey toward a regenerative system. 
here's how I, I manage my own uh, portfolio, my own assets, uh, trying to apply these principles. Again, I won't digress into this now, but just to show you that I'm not just sort of out talking about this, but I've actually managing my own investment portfolio in accordance with these ideas. Um, and uh, I'm happy to say that uh, it's working. Um, uh, one of the things that I, I rate very highly is the value of resilient cash flows. Um, owning Tesla stock going to 600 to 900 is not resilient. Um, as we saw in the last couple of days, I'm much more interested in, in resilient cash flows that are linked to this economic transition that we need. So things like renewable energy infrastructure um, uh, fit right into that and generate resilient cash flows. So there's a way to there's a way to do this without relying on conventional modern portfolio ideas, which are uh, completely uh, irrelevant to the the crisis and the, and the challenges we face. Um, can we do this? Can we make this transition? I think the answer has to be yes. Um, it will apply to each of us individually. It'll apply to every business, every institution. Um, uh, the idea of, of engaging in our bioregions is an age age old idea, really going back to the indigenous wisdom, but that's where a lot of potential exists to kind of break this down holistically in our place then deal with all aspects of it in our place. But we need to start with valuing life as opposed to valuing money um, and see the world holistically. And we'll need to get control of our technologies so that they can help save us uh, and, and use technologies in a way that's aligned with this regenerative process as opposed to simply allowing technologies to rule our future, optimized by what makes money for technology companies, which obviously um, uh, is not is not leading us where we need to go. But all of this is perfectly aligned with the move toward renewable energy. So that's regenerative, not perfect, but it's definitely um, uh, the direction we need to go. Probably less um, familiar to people is the opportunity uh, in in agriculture and in particular uh, on the grasslands. the the you know the cattle have become sort of the bad guy in this in this conversation about agriculture. But the field on the right is managed holistically. This is how I first learned about holistic thinking is through a, um, an organization called the Savory Institute. And the shift in the way we manage cattle to mimic how they, they, the buffalo roamed in nature leaves you with the pasture on the right as opposed to the, the degraded land on the left. And the little chart on the left is quite interesting. Um, there's, a, there's a farmer in, in Georgia in the United States called White Oak Pastures. Uh, they practice holistic um, grazing for their, their beef cattle. And this shows you that um, by, by using this holistic process that essentially grows more grass, which sequesters carbon rather than releasing carbon, they have actually can produce beef with a negative carbon footprint. Um, radically different than the conventional beef on the left, which is a positive 33 pounds per uh, pounds of, uh, of carbon or tons of carbon per, per pound of beef. Um, uh, but even the Impossible Burger and Beyond Burger have a positive carbon footprint because, you know, the, all of the soy and peat and whatever they, they put into those things are usually um, uh, grown using industrial uh, agriculture, and that has a positive uh, carbon footprint. Whereas if you can sequester carbon naturally, you can actually eat some beef, probably less than we Americans eat, um, but also have this benefit of sequestering carbon through the way you manage animals on the landscape. Because again, this, this principle of right relationship, the, the grasslands are the second largest carbon sink after the oceans. And we've, we've re, through our reductionist thinking, we've optimized the production of cattle with no regard to the carbon cycle of, of the photosynthetic process on the world's grasslands, which occupy um, some massive uh, percentage of the, of the land-based planet. So again, there's, there's massive opportunities to reverse climate change and to reverse uh, the um, um, desertification and the uh, species diversity crisis simply by moving land management practices back into their natural form using large herbivores to mimic the large herbivores that used to roam in nature. Uh, the Savory Institute has set up a network of practitioners. And so now companies that want to source regeneratively 
uh, manage uh, herds of sheep and cattle can do so. You can see some of the names that are involved in that. Uh, I'm now involved in a, in, a, in a very interesting project that instead of, um, uh, in, instead of working with cattle is using aqu aquaponics. So um, aquaponics has somewhat of a, you know, a, a mixed uh, reputation, but it can be done uh, very clean. Uh, in this case, the, the idea is that, you know, few people realize that, that it's the feed, it's growing the feed, which causes most of the problem in, in our protein markets, because growing the feed is annual production and annuals uh, grow at big scale in places like Iowa and, and Nebraska. Uh, using industrial agriculture, which degrades the land and, and releases carbon and, and destroys soil. And we do all that growing annual grain to feed chickens uh, who have been genetically modified to look like the one on the right, not the one on the left, which is what they looked like not long ago. Um, but little do we focus on the fact that we've essentially clear cut the, the, the grasslands to grow grain in order to feed our chickens. The cool thing about tilapia fish, which is what we're going to be growing with Waterfield Farms in tanks, is that they are grass-eating fish. So the idea here is the tilapia tanks will then feed shrimp tanks, which will then feed crustacean tanks. So you have this multi-trophic, super-efficient use of feed. Um, the waste from that then goes into a greenhouse to warm the water and produce plants, uh, likely basil and, and cut flowers. Um, but the key to it is all of that, the energy for all of that is solar powered, growing grass, sequestering carbon that gets then sped to uh, the tilapia. So if we can move this to scale, we get the you know, external benefit of displacing corn off of uh, fields, which is an annual crop that destroys the land, and displacing it by growing grass. These are the systemic uh, opportunities that exist if we can think holistically as opposed to reductionistly or in a reductionist way, which is to optimize the fat chicken on the left at the lowest cost. Um, we believe we can compete with the cost of the fat chicken using a healthier source of protein, uh, which is fish, but at the same time stimulate uh, carbon sequestration and water retention in the grasslands uh, back to their natural state. Um, I'm, I'm feeling I should I should move quickly here, but this doesn't just apply to um, uh, agricultural uh, contexts. Um, you could study the business model and the culture of Facebook and Amazon and conclude quite easily that they're very regenerative, uh, optimizing shareholder value um, uh, businesses with no res no regard to those eight principles. But similarly, I've done this, you can look at the business models of Cisco, of Shopify, and even Alibaba, believe it or not, and, um, and see lots of regenerative, uh, lots of the regenerative principles, at least partially at work there. Um, so again, this is not a question of, you know, technology is good or bad, it's how we use technology. And if, um, if, we, can, if we can have a, you know, multi-billion dollar uh, technology companies just, behaving regeneratively without someone telling them to, it tells you that there's economic potential that they're, they're um, uh, realizing, and that's part of this regenerative potential that is, that is certainly very real. But that doesn't mean that every tech company will do that, and, and so having uh, incentives as well as regulations that steer businesses toward a regenerative direction, um, I think, is, is the future. And as I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of this work needs to happen on the ground at the bioregional scale. And um, we've launched uh, a couple of years ago now a network to try to encourage this regenerative development at bioregional scale. And um, if, if people are interested in that, um, there, there is some, we've had some discussions in Holland of doing this. Uh, you know, everyone's too busy, myself included, but think about Europe as not a series of countries, but a series of, of watersheds, which is what this picture uh, depicts. And, and you can see even within that, there's, you know, there's probably a thousand bioregions or sub bioregions and certainly a hundred bioregions in that picture that could focus on their place and try to, you know, move toward these regenerative um, qualities uh, very much on the ground without having to try to change the whole global economy. That's where I think this idea will, 
will first get traction. So in summary, uh, Bucky Fuller, I don't know if that name is familiar, but he was a, a great um, a designer and architect. And I only recently discovered, well, maybe a year and a half ago now, that his last book, um, uh, to humanity, which was published the year he died, was actually a criticism, a critique of the capitalist system. And and if you read this short book, it's it's kind of you can tell it's it's a bit of his farewell message to humanity. And I was blown away to learn in that book that he too was focused on this regenerative process. And he said, nature is a totally efficient, self-regenerating system. If we discover the laws that govern this system and live synergistically with it, within them, sustainability will follow and humankind will be a success. And he knew that in 1983, uh, and we've lost a lot of time uh, not following that wisdom. Um, but today is the first day of the rest of our lives, and I'm I'm delighted that there's so many young people in in this conversation that are interested in this topic because this is uh, this work is 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 your work for sure. And with that, I'll stop blabbing. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, and, could, yeah, and maybe, you, maybe you could uh, end your uh, slideshow. Yeah, my, <laughs> oh, you I see, just, lots of applause. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and quite rightfully so. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always, whenever I, 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 I read uh, work of you or I, I hear you present your work, I'm always fascinated by the, the utter um sense it makes and then the contrast with the way that we are acting it is so it's so big it's so it's gigantic and i, I it yeah it never yeah. ceased to amaze me <laughs> well imagine how you would feel if you were an indigenous person <laughs> who of course this is simply you know modern western scientific jargon saying essentially what the indigenous cultures have always known and always said yeah. and watched us do what we've done. Yeah. Um, imagine how that would feel. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even, I don't even dare to go there. Yeah. Hey, John. Um, so, um, I've seen my colleagues frantically typing. So there has there, we have a lot of questions for you. Uh, and what I want to do is I, I would like to open the ball. <laughs> With uh, with giving uh, the floor to uh, to Martijn Martijn Schiphorst. He's a he's a student uh, at the uh, Saxion University of Applied Science, and uh, he prepared a, a couple of questions uh, for you, uh, and consider them a bit. Uh, you know, his questions are the questions uh, for a lot of students, yeah? so they they share a general interest, and we will take it from there, and then we will open the the, the chat and. Um, and then I will be accompanied accompanied by uh, Brazil, and we will take uh, a, a couple of questions from the chat. But I, I'm absolutely sure we can't answer them all; that they're too much. Uh, but at least we we will we will see how we uh, how we work through uh, through them. Um, so, Martijn, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Hey, welcome, welcome. Hey, so. Uh, so you, so you, you, you've you've listened and heard John's story. So what is before we 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 give you the floor to ask John a couple of questions? I have one question for you. So how so what how is it for you? Oh, well, that's, that's a nice story. I can uh, see a lot of things in the story. What are the same in my story about circular economics? Very good. And, um, like uh, the economic about social impact economic impact, but also uh, impact on the green, uh, the green impact on uh, Holland, but also the world. And I have a couple of questions. Maybe go I ahead. can yeah, go ahead. myself. Yeah, please do. I graduated at SOS Accountants and Officers for the past six months. During my graduation internship, I focused on meaningful entrepreneurship with the purpose of making more social impact as an accountancy firm and making steps forward towards B Corp certification. Maybe you know the certification. To help SOS further, I have drawn up a multiple purchasing policy. 
the supplier's policy ensures that suppliers partners are viewed from a multiple value principle with the aim of making more impact together. I also followed the minor circular economics. It was an, an ed educational and got me thinking about how now with the world. So mm. I have a couple of questions. Go ahead. The first one is, what do you think is a bigger problem? The, blur the blurring of the environmental ceiling or the blurring of the social foundation? Uh, I think they're the same problem or the same question or said differently, they're distinct problems who have at their heart the same um, uh, root cause. And, and um, they're really just different manifestations of the same problem, which is our, our separation from each other, our separation from the planet, and um, you know, you you very quickly move into conversations about consciousness uh, when you try to grapple with this. But um, I think it's I think it's both tactically a bad idea to try to prioritize one over the other, but ultimately is is a um, it's a it's a dead end because at at the heart of it is. Um, again, going back to indigenous wisdom, and I'm not qualified to speak on indigenous wisdom, but one of the things that you'll find throughout indigenous wisdom is that, in fact, I, I think they don't even have the word for nature because they are, they see themselves as nature. And, and um, we've, you know, the Western world in particular has gotten used to this idea that we're separate from nature. So we have a word for nature and nature in politics is a special interest or the environment is a special interest. So uh, I would argue, I would urge us to think holistically about it and, and understand that we all kind of are in this together. And that's, if anything, if there's one lesson from the pandemic, uh, maybe that's the reason the pandemic has been dropped on our head. And at this moment in time is to really understand that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. I have another question. Do you think that new business models co could turn the economic system around or is the first step to turn around the consumer's mindset? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I guess I don't think there's, and, I, and believe me, I, I, like you, I'm searching for, you know, where to focus one's energy, where it's gonna have the most impact and I don't think there is a, a, an answer to those questions. I think it's sort of everything all at once, all together, which is one of the reasons I like the bioregional approach, because you can kind of get your head around, you know, a country the size of, of Holland. Um, Holland is, I don't know if it's a natural bioregion or not, but it obviously has a, a bioregional dominating quality to it, which is, it's very low to the water um, and uh, or to sea level. And I think I think the Dutch have done a great job at, at being Dutch in dealing with that shared context um, and will continue to, to do so. Um, but I, I think that at the heart of this holistic approach is to not allow ourselves to get, you know, into the kind of thinking like this is more important than that. Uh, and therefore, my work's more important than your work. What we need to do is understand that they all have to work together. And by working together, that's what will release the potential. Um, and so all, all of our moonshot, you know, single point solutions to problems inevitably will fall up short. But, but we also all have to decide where it makes the most sense for us to engage in these problems. And, you know, some people are artists and some people are more naturally scientific. And so we need to find our place in the in in the challenge, but that's different than thinking that one's more important than the other. And, and ultimately, I think we all will do best for ourselves and for society by finding what we're truly gifted at at contributing and focusing on that. Okay, clear for me. The third question I have: the baseball principle of the circular economy is cooperation and change that prefer to be closed. Do you think that this can be realized for almost every industry in which a conversation process is involved? 
and what are the impl implications of finance? So the circular economy is, um, you know, it's, it's a wonderful, um, uh, I would say, I think of it as sort of an on-ramp toward the regenerative paradigm, but, um, but it is not an answer to, it, it is not a substitute for the regenerative process. And there's, there's, there's many reasons for that. One, one is that, you know, in many ways, the circular economy is just doing more efficiently the current uh, uh, extractive um, and, and degenerative economy. It's just doing it with less waste. Um, so the motivations for eliminating the waste can't be simply in order to make more money because that excess profit will then be reinvested into Just a heads up, John is muted. John, can you hear me and can you see me? I can hear you. Is there a possibility that you muted, muted yourself? Because Greg uh, is not here. How's that? And for the last, I think, two minutes, we weren't <laughs> able to hear you. I, I don't know how I did that, but can you hear me now? Yes, can you can everybody in the chats say if they can hear John and if they can hear me. Yes, we can now. Sorry about that, everyone. I don't know what I did, but I tell you, Bill Gates is not my friend. <laughs> um, so I, I uh, where did where did I where did I get cut off? Where was I? Your story about the circular economy against the regenerative economy. Yeah. So so. So circular economy fits into the framework in the robust circulation principle, right? So we, we need healthy circulation for sure. I think that principle applies not just to materials and energy, but also to information. So for example, the internet enables massive circulation of information that didn't exist before. So the invention of the internet is, is a huge leap forward to uh, possibilities. Um, uh, but the, the, what, I, what, I, what I was saying that I think I got cut off, in the area of circulation of materials, uh, every time we use a material, whether we, um, you know, however we recycle it, upcycle it, or whatever, um, it gets degraded because of the law of entropy. So it's, a, it's not a solution. It's a, it buys us time. It reduces the, you know, it's, 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 if you go back to that, that spectrum, it's moving from the left toward green, which is essential and vital and critical work, but it's very different than flipping into a whole regenerative paradigm where we wouldn't, you know, in, in a truly regenerative system, we're going to need to find a way to use resources that are not uh, non-renewable in the first place. Okay, thank you for your answer. Now we've got go to my last question. Do you think that the mainly local purchasing, production, and sales shall be the beginning of the foundation of a new economic system? So I'm glad you 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 asked that because you know we're so so first of all uh, the local the local economy idea is very much linked to the bioregional idea, um, not a new idea, not something I'm proposing, but something that is. You know, the way I think of it, it is one of the qualities of a regenerative system is that it is more place based. But that doesn't mean that local purchasing is the solution to our problems. Um, there, there will always be, in my judgment, uh, global trade for, for logical reasons that are important. Um, 
but um, and there and there will be concentrations in some industries much more than others. But where it really feels um, undeniably fundamental is in the area of food production, uh, obviously water and um, uh, and clothing and and the built environment. I mean, all of the kind of you know one one of the things that's wrong with our economy is we measure industries by dollars. We don't have a measure for their kind of intrinsic uh, importance to our our continued livelihood. So we treat technology the same way we treat agriculture. Nothing could be further from the truth. We have to get agriculture right in order to survive. We don't need to get technology right. We don't need um, you know the the ability to have this conversation on, you know, on, on, in real time, as, as wonderful it is. Um, but we actually have to have an agriculture system that works. And from my experience in agriculture, that can't be done on a monolithic global scale. It needs to be done uh, with the wisdom of the people that live in places and, and their understanding of their local bio, bio region. So it's not about purchasing local everything. It's about differentiating uh, uh, between uh, different human activities on this planet and, and in a sense, rating them as vital versus nice to have. And, and um, I, don't have a, I don't have a way to describe this yet, but, you know, again, the local economy thing is, is our, our, our understandable human desire for the silver bullet. All we need to do is everyone buy local. And that's just not, you know, the answer. Um, it's it's more complex than that. Um, so, for me, the value of the principles is to is to always have a compass to look to, and you can say, well, buying local that seems to fit with, um, you know, honor community in place. But what does that have to do with imbalance? And what does that have to do with efficiency and resiliency? Well, if everything is local, it's going to be very resilient but very inefficient, and chances are. We won't be able to conduct uh, the human project on anywhere near the scale of complexity we have today if everyone just buys local. And maybe that's where we're headed, but I would argue that there's some balance between a more intelligent um, uh, use of, uh, of opportunities presented by the global economy versus what absolutely essentially needs to be built in a resilient local way. And local local economies can then trade with the global economy from a position of strength and resiliency, rather than a position of de of depend de um, dependence, which is essentially what the global economy, as currently designed, uh, has has foisted, particularly on the global south. Thank Those you. Big, you know that that question alone is three PhD <laughs> and, and uh, you know I mean, I mean it's it's a great example of the work left to be done. What does global trade mean in a regenerative context? Thank you. Hey, Martin, you did well, man. Uh, thank you. You did great, Martin. Yeah. You, Martin was a, was a bit anxious, but uh, you did you did terrific, man. <laughs> thank you very Martin, much. I saw you had your questions written down in, exam in advance. That's, yeah. that's yeah. smart preparation. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so we're going to open the ball, uh, John. We have many people with many questions. So uh, I'm now accompanied by uh, by Brazil, and uh, and she's been writing down all sorts of questions. So um, Brazil. Yeah, it was really <laughs> helpful that some of you liked the questions and gave a heart to some. So we <laughs> see which questions you guys really want us to ask. Um, we will uh, ask the person that asked the question to. Um, maybe even ask their own question. Yeah, good so um, I saw some people ask about what was the difference between uh, Alibaba and Amazon? Was it their business model or what made them regenerative? And this question was asked by Van den Berg. Would he, he or she like to ask this question to John? B. Van den Berg. Eh? Yes. Hello. Yeah, well, well, hello. hello. <laughs> First, my case. Uh, hey. Thank you, John, for your uh, the man. Hi, <laughs> very, very interesting. Uh, very, very interesting talk. 
Yeah, I was wondering because you mentioned it as a well very quickly that that could be considered regenerative or at least partially so. Mm. And I was just wondering, like, what are some of the characteristics that you that you noticed then to to sort of substantiate that claim? Because it was a really interesting claim that just sort of sidestepped across very quickly. Yeah. So it's it's uh, it's meant to be a little provocative. I've I've been doing a little research on it for the book, um, and it seems to validate my my uh, my initial instinct. But I heard Jack Ma give a talk. Um, I forget where he was on some stage. It was sort of funny. There was there was him and and um, I forget who he was with, and no moderator. And they they were both kind of like looking at each other, like, well, what are we supposed to talk about? But um, but anyway, it, it it's on. You know, you can find it. I'm sure because I was just randomly looking around. Um, but but hearing him talk about his company, um, was was quite interesting to me because he, the the first thing is that it was it was all about working in service of all these small businesses and entrepreneurs, right? So he was he was facilitating. Uh, small Chinese businesses, a lot of them mom and pop shops, to participate in the economy for the first time. So empowered participation, um, robust circulation, um, uh, honors community in place, um, uh, and and a platform that was in service to his customers, as opposed to a platform that was extracting from his customers. That's what that's what struck me most about it. Um, now, you know, whether that's still the case, you know, one of the one of the realities of our capitalist system is that as businesses get bigger, it gets hard to keep growing. And their natural tendency is to shift from very, you know, um, pure origins to less pure, potentially extractive behavior. <laughs> I would say that's a pattern that's pretty much universal. Um, you know, Google used to have the motto, do no evil, and now they extract our data and sell it to people that we have no idea about. So um, uh, maybe that's happening with Alibaba more than, than I'm aware of. But that was the, the initial thought. And, um, and again, I put question mark there. Um, but I do, I do believe that a technology platform like that can be generative to the health of the system as opposed to extracting from the health of the system. I would argue that um, you know Uber, um, from what I know of it, and I, every time I get in an Uber, I ask the driver if they like Uber, and they always say yes. But I also know that they, you know, they're they're extracted from pretty much right to the edge of what's humanly survivable. Um, so, hope that answers your your thought. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. and you mentioned about Amazon. So Amazon's a much trickier one. Of course, we're all addicted to Amazon, myself included, and particularly my wife. Um, but the the and I haven't seen any good research on this, but obviously their, you know, their 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 treatment of their employees is well documented as being, you know, extractive isn't even the right word. It's just, you know, inhumane. Um, but the ecological footprint of addicting us to this instant gratification is is not at all what the human species is here to do. And yet, you know, they give it to us like a drug and we're addicted to it now. And so, you know, if I want a postcard, I can have it on my desk tomorrow. Um, but there, there's also many more insidious things about their business model, um, particularly the linkage with the, um, uh, you know, with the, um, what's it called? The, the, uh, the, plat the technology platform. Um, so they, you know, they see which young businesses are doing well because, they all run on their. Um, uh, someone help me. I'm blanking on the name of the, um, you know, their technology platform. AWS. AWS. Thank you. So, so, but what they apparently do, and I've heard this from someone who knows, is that they'll see, you know, a a particular company growing sales in their data, and they'll knock on the door and say, "We'd like to invest in you," and they'd say, "Well, no thanks. We don't need your capital." And they say, you don't understand, we'd like to buy you or else we're going to compete with you and crush you. And so the, the, there is an a incredibly extractive uh, predatory mindset that seems to permeate that company. But they're doing it brilliantly you know, where the consumer benefits along with their shareholders. 
rather than uh, and you know and 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 everyone else is including the planet is getting is getting damaged. So it's a very you know it's it's uh, it's it's clever, uh, da dangerously clever. Yeah, that's, I mean, thank you for that great answer. It raises a bunch of other questions, but I also want to leave space for others to to ask theirs. So I'll refrain myself, but thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Greg. Yes, the next question we're going to highlight is asked by Fred van Tor about human behavior. He might want to ask it himself. Fred, are you there? Well, then we'll ask the question because a lot of people were interested in your answer. Um, isn't it all about human behavior and the will of being humble? It's a good question. What's the second part? The the will? The will of being humble. Well, isn't it all about human behavior? I, um, you know, I, I, I'm resisting agreeing that it's all about human behavior for reasons I can't quite explain. But um, but obviously, human behavior is is a big part of it. But what causes human behavior to be what it is? You know, there are there are stories that we accept as being the narrative of what's acceptable human behavior. Um, it used to be that we would put, you know, um, bad guys in a ring with lions and and we don't do that anymore. Um, someday we will look at what Exxon did um, in, in intentionally, willfully hiding their understanding of climate change and ask, you know, how is it possible that that wasn't a crime against humanity? So um, I think human behavior can change. And I think the worldview or the paradigm or the, the way we see our place in, in, you know, on this planet, our purpose uh, needs to change in order for all these other things to change. And so in, in that sense, maybe I, I do agree. Um, but I, you know, I think most people are, you know, it's interesting, the, uh, I'm sure you've all been paying attention to the Oprah Winfrey uh, 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 interview last night or whenever it was. But, you know, here you have the depiction of, of the royal family trapped in a system. And and you, I felt actually great empathy for William, or rather for for Harry, um, and 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 I think you know if I think about my old banker friends, they're not bad people. They're trapped in a system, and they do what you do when you're in that system. And they got mortgages and kids and all that stuff. And so I think the system has more to do with our human behavior than we may realize. Um, and so figuring out how to change the system to me is, is at the root of this. And, um, boy, that's a, that's, a, that's not an easy one. Um, and that's a tough one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was a good question. Um, thank you. I have another question from Aldo van Duivenboder, uh, about educators and their role within this process. Aldo, would you like to speak about this? I see all those, so he's in the house. <laughs> yes, I, I am, and, and hopefully you're able to hear my message or my question. Uh, the second largest group, uh, uh, by the way, hello, John. The, the second largest group of uh, here in in the in the room are educators. So next to the students, uh, and we have a role in making the transformation happen. I think. And we have, I think, a role to help young individuals to be able to cope with the ongoing uh, change. Um, what is your message to us educators? What type mm. of role uh, do we take? Or what would you like to say to us? I'm, gl I'm, glad, um, I'm glad you asked, because I didn't say it, but um, it's... Um, you know, the I have that one slide about how this changes everything, including education. And I think you would. What, what do you teach, Aldo? I'm I'm teaching uh, uh, mostly personal development, next to uh, all everything related to uh, well, regenerative uh, education, regenerative design of businesses, oh, cool. etc. Yeah. So you're not the physics teacher I was hoping you were. 
<laughs> not not anymore. I started. Uh, <laughs> I developed. I think there's a um, an enormous uh, missed opportunity in the academy. Um, it's it's and and you know my my exposure to the academy is mostly through having been through business school, undergraduate and then business school. I've never gotten an advanced degree, but I've I've um, been exposed to it enough to think I have a sense of how it works, and I certainly have a pretty good understanding of how it works in economics and finance. And and I think there's no better example of our modern age reductionist. You know, everyone in a silo, expertise. If you want to get a PhD in economics, you have to take as truth what all the other Nobel Prize winners already said, and then come up with some little obscure tweak to that and write a PhD thesis on it. When the the kind of most mind-numbingly obvious truth is staring you in the face that the entire field is built on a on a flawed foundation. And, uh, you know, I so I think the the opportunity in the academy for all the disciplines to not just learn how to collaborate across silos, which is hard, but relatively trivial, but to see the whole in a way that um, that simply, you know, it does not exist in most uh, education disciplines. And so our. Our students, everyone on this call, has been trained by a physicist in physics, and chances are they were trained in Newtonian physics because the other stuff's too complicated. Um, and they were trained in, you know, Darwinian biology, but they weren't trained by Fritjof Capra uh, and the Web of Life. And you know, it's it's almost, you know, I wonder whether it's because we're lazy or because um, the people that there aren't enough academics that really understand the latest science. But once you understand the latest science, and I'm not pretending I really do, I mean, this stuff is super esoteric. In fact, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to revise the eight principles in the book because I've learned more about living systems since I first wrote the paper. Um, and by the way, one of the principles I think that's going to be in the book um, is going to be complex chance. Yeah. So like, the, there is there is no way to predict the future in complex living systems because there's this thing called chance that always messes with things. But that's also the great um, savior because because there's chance, there's evolution and change. Um, so my point is that the, the 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 educators are stuck in the modern age, and this is an unfair generalization. I'm sure there's many exceptions to that. Uh, and many of the exceptions to that have been my teachers, but by and large, it's like we're still teaching the same lesson courses we were 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, and um, uh, I, I think that has to change. So I'm glad you I'm glad you raised it. And for all of the students who've just paid, well, you don't pay tuition in Holland, I suspect. So <laughs> that's a good. One. But um, you know, recognize that. What largely we're teaching our students is is soon to be outdated understanding, um, in particular the the importance of, of 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 integrating together all these fields of knowledge. That's where the real juice lies, and that was what was in the Pope's encyclical's message. I mean, this is not just me saying this. And how 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 do you think we could start that process by by turning it into a more multidisciplinary or even transdisciplinary um, approach to to economics and business in general um, well you know there are there are um, early that so there's a program at McGill same Peter Brown the guy I mentioned earlier has started a um, a program called economics for the Anthropocene mm. and it's largely ecological economics I would say um, he, you know, he had pushback from, he was trying to get, you know, the, the, the law school and the, um, sciences and, you know, really a transdisciplinary approach. I, you know, you, you, you guys will know this better than I, but, you know, you'll get a lot of resistance from within the institution. The institutions are institutions because they resist change. Mm -hmm. That's why they're institutions. So the, the challenge we have in, in changing the system is that the people that lead institutions are good at 
leading institutions and not being curious about what's wrong with their institution. Otherwise, they don't get promoted. And the institutions themselves, whether it's you know the the firm <laughs> or the academy or J.P. Morgan or the central bank or you know whatever, they're um, by definition almost impervious to change. So uh, so I I don't spend a lot of time trying to persuade the quote leaders. Uh, to change their worldview, I think, and this is where, you know, the exciting opportunity for everyone who's, you know, a student today is that the, you know, the change is going to come from the, from the grassroots. It always does. And, and um, uh, you know, it, it'll happen in ways that none of us will predict. Um, and so it's, it's not like write your thesis on your theory of change. You know, again, theories of change. Well, you know, good luck. Uh, if you think, you know, who, who had in their theory of change Greta? Greta had more impact on climate than anybody's theory of change and millions and millions of dollars of grant funding for eco environmental projects and whatnot. And then Greta turns up and sits on the stoop. Um, that's, a, that's a complex um, uh, chance event that shifted everything. Yeah. So that's a nice call for action also for our students to help us reinvent education. Yeah. Uh, and, and not wait for us to tell them what to do in, in, in a way. No. Yeah. And, and yet, you know, I have real trouble with that. I mean, I have, you know, I have three kids who are the, roughly the age of every all the students here. And like to put that burden on an 18 or 20 year old is 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 not is not right. So mm -hmm. I, I think I think it's incumbent upon us old geezers to to learn and to grow um, and to um, in a sense work in service to the next generation who's going to actually implement figure this out and implement it um, and and um, you know it's 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 the first time I don't know if, let me see if this is if I believe this but I would say it's the first time maybe in in hundreds of years where because because this transformation is so profound where the intergenerational uh collaboration is so essential so the the young people can't just stiff arm us old people and say you're stupid you screwed it up you don't know what you're doing because there is some value in our experience um but but we can't just say you know what we don't get it i'm gonna go play golf and good luck uh, you know, hope you're smarter than we were, um, because that's completely you know, yeah, to well. do it together. Thank yeah. you. Very much. And, yeah. I, and I also think that we get it here today, John, with uh, uh, all universities of applied science, or uh, generally yeah. speaking. And I, and I also think that maybe this is also something that is especially uh, important for for us as universities of applied science to do, because it is about applied science. So it's um, it's. Uh, it's quite common to work together on on practices rather yeah. than uh, only do empirical research uh, on uh, on subject. Yeah? So, yeah. Uh, so maybe this is also a, a bit our purpose <laughs> as we are sitting right here to yeah. uh, take this uh, further. Great. Okay, more questions because we we need, we need a uh, in the spirit of um, imbalance, we need a question from a female. Good question. Yes. Is there question. someone that would really like to ask a question that's about the teachers or maybe more the student perspective? Ooh. People are shy. People are <laughs> tired. People are out of beer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe before we search our female speaker, Martijn, could you maybe reflect on the more teacher perspective? How do you look at this from a student perspective? Martijn, you're Martijn. muted. Yeah, can you unmute yourself? Martijn, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, at my study at uh, uh, the Saxion in Enschede, I study bedrijf economy, and we have not a lot of, uh, how you say it, implications of uh, Donut economy or something like that, or circular economy. I think there must be a lot of turnaround in the school system. So a lot of uh, 
things of the circular economy must implicate in the linear economic system and also in the school system and the, the lessons who, who the students follow. Yeah. Because we have no lessons for circular economics or meaningful economics. Yeah. Well, this is all brand new, so that doesn't surprise me. You know, the the uh, the regenerative communities network that I that I talked about um, briefly. Um, we we are imagining that each of these bioregional hubs will become a learning center, and if you think about each of those hubs networked together, perhaps that is the new the next university, um, and and students will come to Aldo's class. And, and then say, I want to go to Peru and I want to go to Chile and I want to go wherever to learn regenerative agriculture on the ground. And that'll be part of their university experience. Um, that's our vision for, I think that's much more promising than retraining someone who's been teaching, I'll just pick on you know Newtonian physics for the last 23 years uh, to, to reimagine how physics um, uh, in, is is um, is relevant to economics because that's a question that most likely that person hasn't ever contemplated. All right, perfect. Um, we have a question from Madeleine Mulder. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? And I, I also see that uh, Lisbeth Rijsak is wanting to ask a question. So we have two females. Uh, yes, yes. Sure. I just put it in the Q and A as well. Um, Having studied what has been happening over the past year, I wonder when from different perspectives, both economics, but also other um, uh, disciplines, do we start cooperating more in a more interdisciplinary way? I'm really concerned about these, these angles. Uh, I'm a lawyer by training. I, I like, I try to look at the world from a systemic perspective, and I think e economists do the, try to do that mostly as well. But I wonder what efforts are we making uh, to bring different perspectives together and integrate them to create that holistic perspective? Good question, Madeleine. Important question. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think um, my, my guess would be that we're, we're too busy, you know, everyone's busy, and that's like an incremental huge project on top of, you know, an already too busy schedule, and that, that's a problem. Um, but that is what what Peter Brown and, and McGill and York University did, is they, they, they sat together and planned a program with, a, with a, a new curriculum that was largely experiential learning, uh, probably, probably two years of planning before they, but it was separate from, you know, he wasn't teaching full-time classes while he was doing that. Um, so, but I'd be happy to put you all in touch with, with him, and you know there'd be a lot of lessons learned uh, from that. But I, I think they, you know, I, I know he was frustrated. You know, this is maybe a little bit off the record, but you know the the academy makes it difficult to do things that are different. But I don't yeah. need to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but think about Thank the you. law. I mean, the the law, the whole private property, that that whole thing needs to be rethought, right? like literally from the ground up. What is private Absolutely. property? Yeah, perfect. Thank you for your answer. I would like to ask Lisbeth Rijsdijk to uh, speak up. Hello, uh, thank you, uh, John. Uh, and I, I want to make a plea for the Dutch Universities of Applied Sciences. Uh, I'm not so pessimistic uh, as, as you are and maybe others, I don't know, in the audience. I think uh, Universities of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands do indeed um, uh, connect a lot with uh, real-life challenges. Uh, students have the, the chance to, to learn uh, together with uh, professionals in the real life, so to speak. And I also wanted to uh, share with you that uh, just this Monday, we won the third um, prize of the Dutch Higher Education Award with our educational concept value creators. And there we exactly do what you were uh, referring to. So we, uh, we tell our students to take a really complex challenge that is close to their heart, where they want to um, make a change. Uh, they, we, we just tell them, create value 
what the value is, you don't know. It will emerge during the process. Ah. Connect with networks outside the university. So make the connections, work together with professional networks outside the university. And, um, um, and also look for uh, the knowledge that you need. Look outside the university. There's a lot mm -hmm. of knowledge there. Knowledge is not a goal. It's a tool to use to make mm -hmm. a change and uh, take the action that you need to take. And one of the results was uh, actually uh, the We All Youth uh, uh, movement. Mm. Uh, I think you know it. Um, yeah. That was started within uh, our university, our yeah. program of value creators. And yeah, I think um, we should um, not uh, lead, uh, also not tell ourselves that it is not possible because of the system or our administration or whatever. There's a lot possible. And I think uh, Case is also a, a very good example of what he can achieve in a very, you know, with all the universities to do the purpose collages uh, like this. Um, so I'm not so pessimistic. Oh, good. Good yeah, so I, I just wanted to give uh, also a, uh, yeah, uh, that sound that uh, uh, we should just make the steps that we are doing and um, we will get there. <laughs> and what a, a, one, I, step that I, I actually am I'm probably overly biased by my exposure to the Finance Academy, where I can assure you I'm less optimistic, <laughs> but but it's great to hear your, your story yeah. and thank you for sharing that. Okay. <laughs> So I I think one more question and then we have to round up uh, folks because uh, we yeah, well it's, it's we are in it for for 2 hours already but uh, we we have one uh, one more uh, I think really interesting question by by Hanana Abaji would you be so kind Hanana uh, and I, so, uh, excuse me, I, I hope I pronounce your name right, sorry. Hi, good evening all. Case, <laughs> you tried it on your very best way. So it's Hanan and it means tenderness. <laughs> what does it mean? Tenderness. Tenderness, oh. Yeah, so I'm um, happy that I am well, the it'll one. It'll be a soft question. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's soft, but Gentle. I was thinking because you were talking about uh, regenerative economy and I was thinking about the role of the educators and um, I belong to one of the grassroots movement because the educational system in the Netherlands is uh, somehow for the privileged children and parents so it excludes the children from the minority groups or the um, marginalized groups and so we started this school but we have to deal with some uh, developments like uh, segregation and uh, uh, and gentrification uh, in, in a city like Amsterdam. And on the other hand, um, the inequality um, still, still rises. So if you pass the primary schools and then you go to the secondary schools and then you go to the higher education, which is I really love the way of the thinking of the uh, universities of applied science, but there is still some discrimination going on and, 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 and some racism and some, and, and it, and the problem is that it is institutionalized. So um, I was searching, like we are the privileged one who are sitting here and talking together about uh, an economy, but are those uh, marginalized groups and uh, the underrepresented groups, what is the place in, in the model you were talking about today? Because are we the elite people they're trying to uh, to to see an economy, uh, but are we? What is the missing link? How can we make it inclusive? Because I don't think that you could be more inclusive. Uh, either you include people or you exclude people. <laughs> you can you can become more diverse, but you you cannot become more inclusive. So, uh, John, please help me because I really want that this school uh, will. Um, educate the new generation and the uh, regenerative uh, regenerative uh, generation and I really need some yeah just pick your mm -hmm. mind to see how can we make this work and not only for the primary schools but for the whole education yeah thanks for asking that and on, and um, you know I I don't have any easy answers or or really answers to that I I think the uh, the first point I would make is simply that uh, we 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 address this issue around the world now as a um, as a um, you know it's like a you're either on 
you're either for it or against it. You're either a good person or a bad person. And um, the only the only contribution I think this framework makes to this, you know, uh, really difficult challenge is um, is that it 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 shows that it's actually not just a moral question. It's a systemic health question. And whether that changes the outcome, I don't know. But my little trivial example of, you know, my toes are empowered to participate in the health of my body means that if we don't provide the same education to the minority communities in a country or in a bioregion that we do to the elite children in a place, um, we're hurting ourselves. And that hurt will manifest either as, you know, um, violence in the street or lost opportunity and, you know, uh, wasted human potential. But all of that affects all of us, not just, quote, the poor minority communities. And um, it's easy for me to say that. It's another thing for us actually to believe that and behave as if we believe that. And I, you know, that gets back to the, um, you know, the, the human behavior aspect of this. But again, if, if and, and I'm not pretending that I'm, you know, some kind of saint and I have this all, you know, locked into my own behavior. But, but the truth is, if you believe in the way living systems work, uh, which happens to align with the wisdom traditions that have stood the test of time, um, you know, we we are one, and 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 we actually need to behave as if we believe that. And um, uh, so, I, I, again, I I think the only thing that this framework adds to that huge um, challenge is that um, uh, it 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 gives us it, it somehow it raises above this um, divide we have now that is, you know, been turned into a, you know, a right versus left, good person versus bad person, and and shows us that there is actually um, scientific as well as, in my, in my opinion, spiritual uh, reasons why the way we behave and see the world is, is flawed. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't do the, the mother of a six-year-old child who can't get into the right school or can't get the right food for dinner tonight doesn't help them much. And I realize that. Well, thank you. It's a very honest answer. Yeah, and uh, it all starts with honesty, eh? doesn't it? It's that the, this and, and humbleness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tenderness, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey folks. It's uh, beyond nine o'clock, so uh, we, we, we have to put an end to this uh, wonderful uh, uh, session. Um, I would like to uh, thank each and every one of you for being part of this. Uh, John, thanks for sharing your, your wisdom uh, with all of us. Thanks uh, for having me. It was, fun. it was good fun. Next uh, time, hopefully in person. Yeah, and, and I, would, I would like to thank all my colleagues at the other universities of applied science and all our students for being part of uh, this, for Martijn, for, for taking the stage as a, as a student and to raise questions. And uh, maybe it's an idea, guys, you've all put your microphones on mute, so maybe we can unmute and then applaud John for a, for a couple of seconds, <laughs> so we can actually hear with... <laughs> We, uh, we're going to do our best to uh, make regenerative uh, uh, economics works in the Netherlands, uh, John, I, uh, I, I promise you. And uh, uh, I look forward to being supportive any way I can. <laughs> yeah, and we, uh, we will send each and every one of you the recordings of tonight so you can work with it uh, in classes and with students uh, or whatever what other reasons you want to work with this. It's all for the good cause. So thank you very much and uh, uh, see you next time. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you.